Please welcome the President Emerita and Professor of Neuroscience at MIT, Susan Hockfield. Good morning on this fabulous morning. Um, today I have the truly great privilege to moderate a panel, a conversation really, among a group of amazing leaders from the greater Boston biomedical ecosystem. They're gonna share with us their perspectives on the future of medical innovation and the unique opportunities they envision for all of us here. They are Lori Glimsher, President and CEO of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Voss Nara Simon, CEO of Novartis, and Eric Lander, the President and Founding Director of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Why don't you all come up and join me? <laughs> right. So um, I know George is uh, extremely proud that both Lori and Voss are me Harvard Medical School graduates and that Eric is a member of the Harvard faculty. Um, it's a great pleasure to join, be on the stage with the three of you, really an honor. So of course we can't start without adding all of our thanks to Len and the Blavatnik Family Foundation for uh, a gift that's gonna fuel our drive to the biomedical future we all dream about. So I've got a few questions, but um, I'm ima imagining that we're gonna just lapse into conversation fairly easily, knowing the three of you as well as I do. So um, the first, we want to start out by um, hearing from each of you how you see this moment in the life sciences. My view is we are poised to do some amazing things, but we want to hear from each of you. So what are the most promising opportunities? And as we think about those opportunities, what are the most daunting challenges that um, threaten to prevent us from delivering on those opportunities? And just to put it simply, what's possible? And what are the obstacles that stand in our way? Lori, why don't you kick it off? Thank you, Susan. I'm delighted to be here. And um, as the CEO of a cancer center, we are at an amazing time for cancer treatment. Uh, this, there have been two major revolutions in cancer therapy in the last decade and a half, and those are precision medicine to target a genetic mutation in the tumor and immunotherapy to activate the immune system, and that recently was awarded the Nobel Prize, as you know. I'd like to say a few words about the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, because it is such a wonderful example of how many, many institutions at Harvard Medical School work together. So the, this Cancer Center Consortium is the largest cancer center in the country, and certainly among the top ranked. And that's because we have seven institutions. We have cancer scientists, cancer clinicians at seven different institutions at Harvard Medical School, all of us with appointments at Harvard Medical School that are contributing fabulous care for our cancer patients, but also leading the force in new cancer therapeutics like immunotherapy. The two cancer drugs that are out on the market now that target so-called checkpoint blockers. That was the discovery of a faculty member at Harvard Medical School, Dr. Gordon Freeman, that he isolated the target against which these drugs are developed. <clears throat> so let me just say the institutions that are involved here. Massachusetts General Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, Beth Israel Deaconess, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard School of Public Health. What a collection of outstanding institutions. And I personally have been privileged as both an undergraduate at Harvard University and a graduate of Harvard Medical School, training at the MGH, affiliated with the Brigham and, and Boston Children's Hospital, to know the amazing power that is enabled by these kinds of cross-institutional affiliations. And so thank you, Len, for allowing us to take that to the next step. Because in the current environment, there's never enough money for research. And I do believe that five years from now, the whole landscape of cancer is going to be changed. We're gonna be able to turn at least some cancers into manageable diseases and cure some other cancers. But we need the resources to do that. We need the collaboration and you are providing that to us. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Alex, as well. Boss. 
You know, it's a funny, funny to be sitting up here. I was just reflecting. It wasn't that long ago, really. I was wandering around the quadrangle with no idea what to do with my life. And now here I am back in front of an, an honor to see Joe Martin and Dean Flyer, um, people who made it possible for me to, to actually be at Harvard Medical School and all the possibilities it opens up. So all I can say to the Levotnik family, you're going to open up possibilities for hundreds, if not thousands, of more people to change the world. And that, that, that is incredible. You know, when I reflect on, on the question, I think back, you know, I like to think about big history. I mean, there's a great book written, Enlightenment Now, that really looks at what's happened over hundreds of years. And when you look at health, for most of human history, we really couldn't move the needle on life expectancy or the quality of life. It was really only 100 years ago we were able to move from a world where people lived only 30 years of, of life to now put the possibilities to live. 80 or 90 years, and I think the most incredible thing happening right now in the world is those gains are getting into the most poorest places in the world. Those gains are now are impacting many, many more people. Now, when I think about the future and I think about all the science and possibilities, it's remarkable now our understanding of fundamental human biology. We've got the proteome very well understood, better and better understood, certainly the genome. Um, what now I think is happening is two, two powerful forces, which I think we all have to now be ready to, to shape. One is new therapeutic modalities. We're moving from a world where small molecules and biologics were our medicines, as they have been for nearly 35 years, to a world where cell therapies and gene therapies are possible. I run a company that now at scale is taking cells out of children and adults' bodies who have end-stage cancers, reprogramming those T cells and sending them back in with cure rates of up to 90%. Cure rates, we never used the word cure before in cancer, and now I think, at least in pediatric ALL, we can use those words. We're in the midst of, I've just filed a therapeutic um, that is based on a, a virus AAV vector, which could be the first gene therapy for a monogenic neurological disorder, and will rapidly, hopefully, become something where we can treat the one in 10 people in the United States and around the world with these kinds of genetic disorders and effect, hopefully cure them of their diseases. But those are scary things, cell therapies, gene therapies that require a lot of investment, a lot of new technology, new regulation, new thinking. What are the limits to this? Do we wanna do these things in utero? Do we wanna do these things? How do we wanna use these powerful technologies? So I think that's one thing, new therapeutic, new therapeutic platforms are gonna become something of a, uh, of a reality. And I know even here at the Quadrangle, xenotransplantation is another example of the work that George Church and others are doing. And then I think the other is, of course, the artificial intelligence explosion. And we have so much data, so little we actually understand from all of this data. How we make that data interoperable, how we make that data mineable, how we then use that data to actually find either new targets, new patient populations. I have a dream that we'll be able to do clinical trials where we can actually identify those who are super responders prospectively and then really be able to have dramatic impacts on, on human health. So lots of possibilities. I think the, the biggest risk is going to be a, a lack of faith in science. I mean, in, in a sense, right now, we live in a world where, because of all of the polarization, science is being questioned, and we can't let that, that happen. Great. Eric? Well, first, I also want to say thank you to Len. I can't imagine Len actually sitting still in London, even if he is recuperating. <laughs> um, I, I just want to thank you, Len, for the combination of vision and complete impatience that you bring to these problems. That right mix is what it's really going to take to move it forward. And this is an amazing gift at the right time in the best community in the world. So wherever you are in, in London, thank you very much. I find I agree with you a lot, Vas, about your, your framing. I'll, I, I might put it in the kind of academic compliment to the way you were describing it. I think 100 years ago, medicine was unrecognizable compared to today. Nobody then could understand even what we were talking about because there's been these series of revolutions, and I think that's not going to stop. In the fields I know best, a revolution, being able to read out all the genetic information, take a comprehensive view of all that information. Even a decade or two before that, people would say, it was crazy, you're not going to be able to get that. We're now living through a revolution to characterize all the cells in the human body, mm. a human cell atlas. Well, I remember, it wasn't even 
10 years ago, six, seven years ago, people said, well, you're never gonna be able to do that, and they had a long list of reasons, and now there's a head of steam amongst young people around the world who are very confident we're gonna have that complete atlas. And, and then it's gonna be assumed that of course we know that comprehensive information. What's coming next? I think if you build up from the comprehensive view of genetic information, the comprehensive view of how it's read out in cells, the next level up is probably the programs. If you said to people, most people on the street, uh, we're, we're gonna have a catalog of all the programs that cells know how to run, they'd look at your cross-eyed. But not the young people, not the students at the medical school, not the students in, in Cambridge, because I think they recognize that there is this progression to turning biology into a comprehensively understood discipline. And we're gonna take it up level to level. And if we understand the programs, we're gonna figure out how to write programs. We're gonna have, well, just as in the 1940s, molecular biology came into existence as biology merged with chemistry and physics. I think as biology merges with the data and a set of engineering tools, we're gonna to have a kind of programmable biology. Hmm. And the things you're talking about are, we're gonna look up how to deliver a therapy to the cell type of interest so we get a big therapeutic window so it doesn't go to the wrong place. We're gonna look up drugs that activate in response to only those cells that are running a particular program. And I have no idea exactly mm -hmm. how that's gonna work, but with gifts like this, with, with visionary gifts that aren't targeted in the narrow, but are targeted to the big picture of, of how we could think radically differently, I think we're gonna see changes like that and all of us are gonna find that 25 years ago, 25 years from now, medicine is gonna look so much further mm -hmm. than we could ever imagine today. Right. And that's what's exciting about today and about this community. I just wanted to follow up uh, on what you said, Voss, about artificial intelligence and the promise that it holds for cancer. So I, I can imagine a day, five or 10 years from now, when a patient with cancer comes into the hospital and because of the massive amounts of data that we have used machine learning, artificial intelligence to gather, and that includes the medical record, the pathology, the radiology imaging, the genomics, the immunoprofile, we gather all those masses of data and we're gonna be able to say to that patient, listen, we know what cancer drugs you should be taking now. Because we have analyzed all your data and we're not going to waste your precious time putting you on drugs that we know from your profile you're not gonna to respond to. Also cost effective, of course, because some of these drugs cost a lot. I would like to say, though, that these are transformative drugs for cancer. There's a difference between Me Too drugs and transformative drugs. And Novartis is making transformative drugs, the new cancer drugs of transformative. Nevertheless, we don't want to use them when they're not going to help our patients. So I think that day is coming. But it takes a dream. It takes a dream, and it takes intense collaboration amongst many institutions, including the Broad. We have faculty members who have laboratories at the Broad. This is wonderful. The talents are complemented. We do a lot of the biology. The Broad does its amazing work in technology. And this is, you know, this is the way that science is developing. Science and medicine are developing. Let me ask the three of you, actually. So you just hit on something. So, Laura, you called out this incredible biomedical ecosystem. And the three of you, I, mean, I can't think of getting three people on stage with me to more <laughs> better represent the, you know, the academy, the industry, the academic medical centers. This is just extraordinary. So as we think about this, uh, you know, world leader by a long measure ecosystem that we have, what do you think would be the tools to actually performing better on our assets? What, what would we do together that really we can't do individually? Boss, why don't you well, start? I mean, just one reflection I have. I go all around the world meeting, you know, um, countries, leaders, and everybody's asking, how do we create an ecosystem like the one that's in yeah. Boston, yeah. Cambridge? That's yeah. what every, even the folks in San Francisco asked me that question, <laughs> if that makes you guys feel good. good. So um, there's definitely, uh, East Coast is beating West Coast at the moment. And so um, I, I think there's a tremendous mm -hmm. opportunity to, to do more, but I think you can't be complacent. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, 
I think what, you have to be humble with respect to all the things we don't know. I, I'm struck by how little we understand, let's say, about the world of whether it's microRNAs, what are they all doing, and still non-coding DNA. All of the proteome, where we still don't know, we may have mapped it, but we have no idea what most of the things are doing, right. and are they druggable or not. There are more cell therapy trials in China than anywhere else in the world. Um, and so we can't have the community here be complacent. We have to keep looking, I think, about reducing transaction costs. So where are there places of collaboration, reducing transactions? A great example is what the Dana-Farber is doing with their cell therapy mm -hmm. manufacturing unit. That's a place for collaboration, reducing transaction costs, enabling things to happen. But I think the community has to stay vigilant because everyone now wants to create this and they're trying really hard, particularly Shanghai, I would say, is one place. <laughs> but this idea of accelerating the transition, you know, making the shorter from you know, lab discovery into the bedside, how can we together actually reduce the transaction time and the transaction costs? How can we work better as a community in uh, the extraordinary way we're forming these individuals? So the key word you just hit on, it's community. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened in Boston over the last 25 years, 15 years, is we've gone from a bunch of excellent separate institutions to a community. Mm. And our young people, whether they're at Harvard Medical School, the School of Public Health, MIT, any of the hospitals, they actually have allegiance to a problem, to solving a problem, to transforming the world, and they view themselves as part of one community, mm -hmm. and in many different ways. I mean, Laurie was saying the, the great collaboration between the Farber and the Broad. We've got this floating community of people who neither Laurie nor I keep track of exactly where they are. I don't know where what the Broad is doing ends and the Farber begins, because it's not the relevant mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. They're coming together, and they're coming together because it's what it takes to solve the problems. 25 years ago, the best biomedical research would go on at your bench. The data you needed was in your lab notebook. We're now at the point where the medical problems we want to solve, young people want to solve, they can't solve without working together in a community. Right. Yeah. They can't solve without the folks who really know AI, and it's not a handoff. They can't even do the basic research properly without thinking about how clinical translation might someday work for that. So the fact that the, the intellectual questions are also integrated has meant that the social reaction, the building of communities, has been happening. And I think kudos to all the institutions that, that we've been figuring out how to, how to match that need and the, and the recognition by the young people. So the question is, how do we support those communities? How do we make it possible? You know, in the small, you put out food that tends to attract graduate <laughs> students. In the large, no, but I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's social and social engineering. In the large, it's you create capabilities that they can use. It's you teach so that people understand translation right. even when they're doing basic. I think that's our challenge. And again, I'm just gonna go back to this amazing gift. That's what makes the gift so special because as wonderful as Shanghai is and many other places are, there is no biomedical community like this, and we have an enormous responsibility to deliver. And I think, you know, to say something specifically about the partnership between academic medical centers and industry, to me, this is a marriage made in heaven because academic medical centers are terrific at basic discoveries, and we can translate those basic discoveries quite far along the pipeline, getting to a point where we might even have a compound that will be able to be used in preclinical animal studies. But when it comes to actually making new drugs for patients, we must and should yeah. collaborate with our private sector partners. As long as we're completely transparent about those interactions, this is really this is what matters to our patients. I think we all have the same mission here. Yeah. We all have the same mission. We want to improve health for everybody, not just here in Boston, in the United States, but globally. And the way we can best achieve that is by having productive interactions with the private sector. And Dana-Farber has had an alliance with Novartis Voss, I think, since 1982. Yeah. And those many, many years of collaboration amongst and between 
people at both institutions have led to the production, discovery of, and translation into human patients of multiple drugs. And yeah, absolutely. And then most recently, just a, a new drug for AML, first, first breakthrough mm -hmm. in, in, in right. decades. So no, I think that that's what I've learned. I mean, of course, having come from this community, I mean, in the end, the, what we can bring is the scale, right? I mean, the scale and the capabilities. We run 550 clinical trials a year, have 68 manufacturing sites, and operate in 150 countries with 125,000 people. Our ability to take a discovery and make it into a medicine that reaches you know, millions, hundreds of millions of people. Our medicines reach over a billion people every year. Uh, we're almost at our billionth dose of malaria therapy uh, with our, our, our Temzin and combination therapy for malaria. So that's the power of, of the collaboration. It's why we put our research headquarters right in the middle of Cambridge and we keep expanding it. Um, and it's why we'll continue to see at least uh, us try to be part of this ecosystem, absolutely. So as my colleague uh, Phil Sharp says, that technology travels on two feet. Yes. And the advantages of being only a few miles from one another is clearly been expressed in all that you've said. So I'd have to say, I have to thank you for sharing your insights, your dreams, your aspirations, but also sharing your ideas of the paths that are gonna get us to fulfilling those dreams, not in the distant future, but the near future. Thank you Great. all thank really you. a lot. Well done.